You're listening to the weekly Parsha podcast with Ari Goldwag, recorded with Hashem's never-ending assistance in Ramah B'Shemesh Israel, 5778, 2017. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Miketz, and I'd like to share with you some thoughts. We always have Parsha's Miketz, the story of Yosef, always coincides with the holiday of Hanukkah. So I'd like to make a bit of a connection, try to understand what is the message of the story of Yosef, what's the depth that's going on here, and how does that relate to the idea of Hanukkah or the depth of the message of Hanukkah. Also, I'm very excited about the fact that I just got a Hanukkah present of this beautiful set of Medrash. Excuse me, sorry about that. Brand new, my parents got it for me, with many Meforshim, lots of commentaries, so hopefully it will add to our depth of understanding as well. Okay, I'd like to share with you a Medrash. I want to focus in on the fact that we have in this story something really um, interesting. It's it's just, it pulls us into the story, the fact that there are all these dreams. Yosef himself has the dreams at the beginning of the story, and he has those two dreams with the with his brothers bowing down to him, the sheaves and the stars, uh, the sun and the moon and the stars. And then we have the dreams at the end of last week's Parsha, the Sar Mashkin, the Sar Ophim, the, the uh, one who was in charge of the bread of, of Paro, of Pharaoh, and one who was in charge of the wine, the cupbearer of Pharaoh. So they had their dreams, and then in this week's Parsha we have Paro's dreams, and each of their dreams contains symbolism and needs explanation. And Yosef is, uh, has this amazing gift that he's able to understand the symbolism of dreams, and he's able to understand the message, which is coming down from a higher sphere to the particular individual who has the dream. And it's interesting because to all of us, I, I believe, you know, I've, my, myself, as I mentioned in my say for my book, so I've had dreams that actually were clearly significant. I had a dream once about uh, my tefillin melting and and uh, it happened, actually happened. I had a dream once and then a few months later I had the dream again and then ended up getting my tefillin checked and indeed the letters inside of my tefillin had melted. So... This is something that goes on. I experienced it myself. Perhaps many of you have as well. That we can get messages from a higher realm in our dreams. Sometimes it has to do with who we're supposed to be, or sometimes it's our subconscious mind uh, giving us a, a, a vote of confidence. Whatever it is, we have dreams, and uh, the dreams sometimes are significant, sometimes they're not. But certainly in the story of Yosef, we see that they are significant. Now, I'd like to share with you as a medrash that speaks about the concept of dreams, and the idea that depending on the way a dream is interpreted, that will actually affect how the dream manifests. So this is a significant idea, and and I'd like to understand. I'd like to understand the idea, and I'd like to understand how it applies to us, perhaps, or or what's the idea in the context how it, how it can uh, connect to Hanukkah. Let's see. So the so Paro at the beginning of our of our parsha has these two dreams, and he's very disturbed by the dreams. The fat cows and the skinny cows, and the skinny cows swallow up the fat cows, and the same thing with the wheat. And there are seven of them, etc. He doesn't know what the symbolism is. We all know because we've heard the story so many times, but Paro didn't know, and he was very very uh, disturbed by the dream. And the Sar Hamashkim, who had been in jail with Yosef, and Yosef had interpreted his dream two years previous. So he remembered, he remembered Yosef and the interpretations that were correct that Yosef gave, and he wanted to, you know, bring this opportunity to Paro, to Pharaoh, to be able to have someone interpret his dreams. Interestingly, the measure says that uh, the Sar Mashkim wasn't like so altruistic here. Uh, he was concerned that if Paro, if something would happen to Paro, he was so disturbed, maybe he would die or something would happen to him, and he would end up being replaced by a different pharaoh who may or may not hold him in esteem. He may lose his job. So he wasn't really concerned uh, with pharaoh so much, or even, or for sure not with Yosef, with Joseph, but he was concerned about himself. Just, that's just an interesting side point. But in telling over the dream, in, in telling over the fact that he had had these dreams, and that Yosef had interpreted the dreams, so the Saramashkim gave the opportunity for pharaoh to bring Paro out, to bring, I'm sorry, bring Yosef out of the jail. And in so doing, Yosef had the opportunity to explain the dream. He did indeed explain it properly. And he was appointed to be the second in command only to Pharaoh 
as uh, the new leader of the, the uh, really the world at the time, because Egypt was the greatest power at the time, similar to what America is today. So now, so he told Yosef, he told Paro about Yosef, sorry, that he had translated and explained the dreams that he, the Sarah Mashkim, had had, along with the Sarah Ophim. Now, the Medrash brings us a story, brings us a, a true story. There was a story with a particular woman, the Asas Lagabi Rebbe Eliezer, who came to Rebbe Eliezer, she said, I saw in my dream that a certain, um, a certain object in my house was broken. So Rabbi Lazar explained this dream that it means that you're going to give birth to a child and he's going to live. Meaning, what was the broken vessel in her dream? It was referring to the fact that maybe her water was going to break or the fact that she was going to have a child would come into the world. So he interpreted it positively. So she went, and indeed, that's exactly what happened. She had a baby, and uh, the baby was normal and fine. She came another time to ask Rabbi the meaning of her dream. So she found that the students were there, but the but the Rav Rabbi Yezer, was not there. So she said to them, "Where is your teacher? Where is Rabbi Yezer? So they said, "Tell us what you need. Maybe we can help." We can uh, answer you. She said, "I saw the vessel in my house was broken." So they said, this dream means that the thing that's going to break is your husband, that you're going to end up burying your husband. So when she left, she started to cry. She, she walked out and she was crying out. Apparently he had returned by this point and he heard her uh, yelling. He said to them, what did you say to this woman? So they said, well, she came to, to ask you a question. So he said to them, what did you tell them? What did you tell her? They said, this is what we told her. We told her that uh, the meaning of the dream is that her husband is going to die. So Rilyesa said to them, you caused the loss of a human being, of a human life. And he quoted them the verse in our parsha. This very verse that that the Sarah Mashkim said to Paro that exactly the way that he explained the dreams is exactly what occurred. So what do we see? We see from here that based on the way a dream is interpreted, so the the interpretation of the dream is what takes effect. So the dream could actually be interpreted in different ways, as we see when Eliezer first explained the dream, the same dream, to mean that she's going to have a child. And then they explain, his students explain the dream that they're going to, that she's going to lose her husband. And indeed, the explanation affects what occurs in the dream. And there's a Gemara in Brachas that speaks extensively about the interpretation of dreams and how the interpretation affects the, the outcome of what, how the dream manifests. And it talks about a particular story with somebody who, there were two people that used to come to him, two sages would come to this par- particular person who could interpret dreams. One of them would pay him, one of them wouldn't pay him. The one who paid him, he would give positive interpretations. The one who gave, would, wouldn't pay him, gave, they gave negative interpretations. And however he interpreted the dreams is, is indeed what happened. But we see that the interpretation affects the dreams. It's very interesting. It's very uh, remarkable. Okay. Rabbi Yechanan said something uh, slightly different, which is interesting as well. When it comes to the dreams being interpreted, so it always goes after the interpretation, except for a dream that a person has when he, when he drinks wine. When a person drinks wine and he has a dream, so then the, the interpretation of the dream does not affect the dream. It does not affect the manifestation of that dream. For those who drink 
and the the dreams that they have will be will be positive dreams will be interpreted positively there are those who who drink and when they drink so the result of their drinking when it comes to the dreams that they have is going to be negative when a, when a Torah scholar drinks so the result is that he has positive dreams and positive interpretations so when a person who is an ignoramus when he drinks so the dreams that he's going to have are going to be negative and they're going to have negative outcomes okay so that's just an interesting thing and then we have the final point which i which i also find to be interesting i remember yavo i think really anything that's to do with dreams is pretty interesting he says that when it comes to the dreams so the subject of the dreams the the subject matter of the dreams does not have any effect it's not it doesn't the the way it's it's not so clear exactly what he's saying here but earlier we see um, in regards, he says this exact statement in regards to the dream of Yaakov. You know, Jacob had a dream of a, of a ladder with, with angels going up and down the ladder, and the ladder symbolizes something. The, li- the ladder is not literal, and in so Rabbi Avo is saying that when it comes to the understanding of what the dream means, the symbolism within the dream is just that. It's symbolism. It's not literal. The ladder that Yaakov saw symbolized represented something. The cows that Pharaoh saw represented something. The sheaves that Yosef saw in his dream, they represented something. The actual literal thing that you see there is not to be taken literally, but rather it symbolizes something. So when it comes to understanding what a dream means, we need to know that it, it uh, it's symbolic. I'm just remembering how in my dream, when I saw my tefillin melting, so um, in, in actuality it was the letters inside the ink of my of the letters inside of my tefillin on this on the parchment inside of my tefillin had melted but the uh the in my dream the button the outside melted the tefillin themselves melted it was symbolic of the fact that uh, there was something that had happened to my the the letters in my scrolls and the inside of my tefillin which is just pretty cool so that's what rabbi avo is, is saying so now the thing that i want to discuss um, the idea I want to talk about or try to understand is like what's the what's the idea here of the dreams what's the idea of the dreams of Yosef and and the dreams of the Saramashkim and Paro of Pharaoh and I just want to understand like the depth of what's going on here and also relate it to Hanukkah like I said one of the things that I was thinking about which I think is pretty clear as we read these stories you know the Saramashkim and the Sar Ophim in last week's Parsha they didn't they, those dreams didn't really affect them, right? So those dreams, the Saramashkim in three days was about to be released no matter what, and he was going to be put back in his place. The Sarah Ophim, the baker, he was about to be released and be killed. The fact that he had those, they, they both had those dreams wasn't really for them. Those dreams were really, they happened because it was necessary for Yosef in order to be released two years later. The Saramashkim needed to remember the fact that he had interpreted the dreams properly. That's just an important point. Paro's dreams, Pharaoh's dreams also, were they really necessary and important for Paro himself? So, yes and no. Yes, because he needed to know that his country was going to have a famine. and He needed to prepare for it. But it was more significant and important that, that the dreams occur for Yosef. So Yosef could get into the position of power, which was necessary in order for his original dreams to be fulfilled because there are two parts to the dream one is that Yosef is meant to be the leader the ruler over the world really he's meant to be the ruler the leader over Egypt which is the center of the world at that time the, the greatest power in the world at that time so the Jewish people and they are being led by Yosef Yosef is the is meant to be the leader of the Jewish people that's clearly the theme that's going on throughout these parshios so we are meant to come into Egypt and to have a certain effect on Egypt. The Jewish people are meant to be there and have an effect. The Arizal speaks about the fact that ultimately we wanted the, the Egyptians to convert. We, we had many, many converts from the Egyptians by the time you see us time the Exodus occurred. But it begins with Yosef, and it begins with the fact that Yosef Hatzadik, this great righteous individual, he is the one who provides for the physical needs of the country of Egypt and ultimately the entire world at that time. 
And so that's the beginning. That's the first part of the fulfillment of Yosef's dreams. But the second part really is the depth of the fact that he is not just a leader over the world. He is a leader over the Jewish people. And that is what he's trying to bring into play when it comes to the brothers coming in. Yosef doesn't remember the things that they did wrong to him. Why? Because that's not really significant to him. He, he, he had a very clear perception that everything that had gone on with him until that point was in order to, for him to reach the position which he was supposed to reach, which was to lead the world and ultimately to lead the Jewish people. And he knew, and this is something that we spoke about in previous weeks, but he knew that he needed them to choose him, to bow down to him. They're bowing down. They're the female aspect. Yosef is the male aspect. He's the tzaddik. He's the, the male aspect. He's the yisoyed aspect. The tribes themselves are the malchus aspect. They're the ones who surround him. Right, that's the female aspect. Uh, the the female, like the pasuk says, the, the you know we, we find by by a kala goes around the chassan seven times. They're surrounding in his dreams, so the, the the tribes surrounded him and bowed down to him. That's the aspect of of him being the leader, the male aspect, and them being a reflection of his leadership. Them them they, they are bowing down to him. So, but he needs them all to be that aspect, which is why he makes sure that Binyamin comes down. Because he needs all 12 of them, or really all 11 of them, to bow down to him. He is the center. They need to admit to his leadership, to his greatness, to his power, to the fact that he is the one who is meant to guide them, to help them, both physically give them food, which, which happens immediately on their arrival, but also, uh, in a spiritual sense, give them direction. So one of the things that Yosef is trying to do is that he's trying to make sure his job, you know, it seems like very strange. Like, what, what is he doing? Why is he running them around and giving them such a, a difficult time? But he, he knows that he's their leader. He's the one who is in charge of their spiritual perfection, you know, creating tikkunim. They had done something wrong in the past and they knew that. They needed to rectify that. But beyond that, Yosef, Joseph was the leader of the Jewish people and he needed to, as in the past, Vayave as the Basam Ra'el Avim, he was bringing a negative report to their father. Why was he doing that at the beginning of the story? Because he was the leader. He was in charge of them. He needed to help them. They hadn't acknowledged it yet. Only later were they able to acknowledge it. And, and that was his job. He understood that. He realized that. He knew that his original approach to them was correct. It was just too early. And so uh, that this brings me to the point, which I really want to bring out, which is an amazing thing that Chazal say, that when a person has a dream... So they should wait up to 22 years for that dream to be fulfilled. And that brings me to an amazing point that we find that it, where do Chazal get it from? Where do our sages get it from? From Yosef at Tzadik. Because from the time that he was 17, when he originally had the first set of dreams, until the time that the brothers came and bowed down to him, it was 22 years. He was 39 years old at that point, right? Because it had been 13 years. He was 30 when he stood in front of Paro. Seven years of the good years had passed, two years of the famine had passed, so he was 39 years old at that point. It had been 22 years since he had left his brothers. They didn't recognize him, right, because he didn't have a beard at the time that he left, and they did. He recognized them, they didn't recognize him, as, as the Medrash speaks about. So, but it was 22 years, I mean, that's a long time. Think about it, that's, a, that's an incredibly long time. But all that time, he knew that he had had these dreams, and the dreams were going to be fulfilled, but he had the patience to see that the dreams were going to be fulfilled. And indeed, he acted in a way to cause the dreams to be fulfilled, which is why he was having them bring Binyamin, bring Benjamin back down, as Rashi tells us. But the idea that I want to bring out is the patience. The patience of Yosef. He had tremendous bitachon. He always had a positive attitude when it came to everything that was going on in his life. He did take the opportunities. He did recognize. He saw immediately when those dreams occurred, the Saramashim and the Sarofim, they didn't need those dreams. He saw that immediately. It was obviously for him. He didn't know how that was going to manifest. He tried to bring about the next stage. He did put in effort. He did do that. It was too much. He had to wait another two years. But Lamaisa there was a, a patience on his part, there was a patience, a deep patience, a deep bitachon, a trust that the dreams would be fulfilled. He would indeed become that great leader that he was meant to become. And indeed that's what happens. 
Now, I, I was thinking about it in terms of, of Hanukkah, relating it to Hanukkah. You know, on Hanukkah, the, the holiday occurs in the winter. It occurs at a time when it's very dark. And the story itself occurs in a very dark time in Jewish history when Hellenism was taking hold. There were very few people within the Jewish people who were dedicated to the Torah, to the precepts of the Torah, to keeping the traditions alive of the Jewish people. Many people had become affected, deeply affected by the, the Greek theology and, and their, their complete dedication to physicality as opposed to spirituality, and that's really what the war had to do with. But the darkness, the darkness reminds me of the, of, of the dreams. The dreams of Yosef are like these, these points of light in a very, for 22 years, think about it, or at least 13 years from the time that he had the dreams until he became the leader in Egypt. So it was an incredibly dark time for him, but there were these points, these small points of light. And the, the points of light were the dreams themselves that had to shine through the darkness for him and provide for him that, that ability to see, to recognize, to think about the fact that Hashem is with him. He had very, you know, think about it, he was in jail for 12 years. What did he have to hold on to? What did he have to hold on to? But he knew he could see a few different things. The main thing, I think, was the dreams that he had originally. And then when the Sarah Ophim and Sarah Mashkin came in, those dreams again, those were the points of light. And Pharaoh's dream again was another point of light for Yosef. He also had the positivity the, the, the recognition of the fact that whatever he was doing, he had atzlacha, he had siyata dishmai, he had divine help. That was clearly there as well. But another thing that I want to bring out is the fact that he saw the dreams, and, you know, these dreams could have happened in, in numerous different ways. Perhaps, you know, originally, if the brothers would have accepted him at the, at the onset of the story, things would have been completely different. They wouldn't have had to go down to Egypt, perhaps, or they would have come down instead of in chains or in, in, in a, you know, in a very negative way of them selling him, etc. It could have, it could have been translated. It could, the the dreams could have been interpreted on the ground differently, but this is how it turned out. It turned out based on, the, you know, that's just how they understood it. The, the brothers interpreted it negatively. You think you're going to rule over us? Because they understood that the dreams meant. That, that he's supposed to rule over them. But are they going to accept that rulership? They're not going to accept it so easily. So they interpreted the dreams in a way that would cause it to take a long time. But Yosef had the patience for that. Interestingly, there's different ways of... Even Pharaoh's dream itself, the measure says, that he could have interpreted it different ways. It could have been instead of 7 and 7, it could have been 14 and 14. Or it could have even, even been 42 years of famine. And two years only happened now, but the other 40 years happened later. It's very interesting. It's worth seeing the measures. But the idea I want to bring out is that the dreams go by the interpretation. Hashem gives us something. He gives us potential. And it manifests based on how we receive it. Yosef has a dream. The brothers receive it in a certain way. So it manifests the way that they receive it or don't receive it in their case. And it's the same thing with the dreams and the story with the woman who had that broken vessel in her dream. And, and it's the same in, you know, Hashem gives us, the dream is like a point of light. It's a potential. How does it manifest for us? How do we receive that light? In the story of the Maccabim, in the story of Hanukkah, so they had, the light that they received was this ability to overcome their enemies. They were a small amount of, of people. They were, they were few. They were, they were, dedicated to Yiddishkeit, to Judaism, to the precepts of the Torah, and we still have that today. It's manifest today because of the way that they received those miracles. They received that light. They established that we should light these candles, these little candles, and recognize that there's a little bit of light in the darkness, in the darkness of the winter, in the darkness of Argolus, of exile, in the darkness of where it seems that all of the forces from outside, the secular forces are coming and trying to destroy us, but there's a little bit of light can we connect the dots? Can we connect a little bit of light and receive that light and interpret that light that it applies to us and how it applies to us? And can we have the patience when the light only shines a little bit here and a little bit there, a little bit of light here, another, a, another little bit the next day, another bit, little bit the next day? Can we receive that light? Can we interpret that light and recognize that it speaks to us? 
and and not just ignore the dream, but actually be disturbed by the dream or or inspired by the dream, inspired by the light, and see that that light is talking to us. So I want to bless you, and I ask you to bless me. Hashem should help us to take the opportunity of the lights of Hanukkah, to receive that light, to interpret that light, see how it applies to us, to see how that spirituality, that story from so long ago, talks to us and how we can break out of the Hellenism that's in our days. Hashem should help us to learn from this story of Yosef, the patience that he had, despite the, the negative interpretations of the dream, the patience that he had for the ultimate positive interpretation of the dream, the true depth of the interpretation which he understood himself. Hashem should help us to have that patience, to learn from a Yosef, to see the spirituality in our lives and to receive that light. And Hashem should help us to be zeicha, to merit, the rebuilding of the temple, and we'll all rededicate the temple and see those amazing menorah lights burning in our base HaMikdash. Have a great Shabbos. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast was made possible through the gracious donations of listeners like you. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.arigoldwag.com or search on iTunes, Ari Goldwag.